I'm probably weighing in at 16 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to move it along as, as, as fast as, as is prudent. Um, two themes on economics and Trump. First, economics cannot solve for uh, the path of America's economy uh, under Trumpian policy, or even the change of path that will result. But I do think that Trumpian policy is dangerous, and I will discuss that. Second theme, Trump's thinking about the economy is based on poor economic models. So I'm apprehensive about the consequences of those policies. I begin with the latter theme, Trump's thinking and the economy. Uh, I think that Trump has relied on some Keynesian beliefs he may have picked up at Wharton in the 1960s. <laughs> Larry Klein, you know those people? You're too young. Um, beliefs, many of which Keynes himself rejected by the end of his life. <clears throat> we see that Keynesian, that Keynesian perspective at work when Trump says that the large excess of our imports over our exports, over our exports siphons away some of the aggregate demand for domestic output for the GDP. This tenet of Trump's is reminiscent of the famous theme of Raul Prebisch, the influential Argentine economist of the 40s and 50s, sometimes called Latin America's Keynes. He thought that what he termed import substitution diverted Latin American economies from the development of manufacturing and a high level of investment, which was why Latin America remained poor. Another tenet of Trump's is also Keynesian, the belief that output and employment are pulled up by fiscal stimulus. While Trump and Secretary Mnuchin were not explicit, they left it to others to say that the personal income tax cuts in high and low brackets would generally boost consumer demand and the cuts in corporate profits taxes would boost investment demand. That same belief was held by those policymakers in the West who maintain that fiscal stimulus, more public spending and tax reduction, pulled employment from the depths of the Great Recession. And a policy of fiscal austerity, a pretty tight rein on public spending and little in the way of tax cuts, prevented or slowed recovery. But is this belief true, I began to wonder two years ago, did countries where fiscal deficits in the years after they hit bottom, did countries where fiscal deficits in the years after they hit bottom that were relatively big, big deficits, as measured by the increase of public debt from 2011 mm -hmm. to 2017, normalized by the level of GDP, proved to have relatively speedy recovery of employment or not? The evidence in figure one, there we, is that it? Yep. Uh, the evidence in figure one, where am I? Okay, does not support that. The relationship, if there is one, is negative. Perhaps the fiscal profligacy in Spain, Portugal, and Italy got in the way of recovery. How about that, Keynesians? Um, just kidding, I love you. <laughs> How could this be? <clears throat> I would argue that when an economy upon bottoming out, finds itself already mired in a swollen public debt. Finds itself already mired in a swollen public debt. It will face a worse fiscal drag the larger the deficit is uh, that it chooses to run in subsequent years. Um, for first, some evidence. Consider the post-war economic crisis 
before the Great uh, Recession. What is the first post-war uh, economic crisis? Well, it was when the returnees from the war uh, drove uh, the civilian labor force from 53.9 million in 1945 to 60.2 million in 1947. Imagine that. Suddenly, the economy was inundated with returnees from the war. Keynesians, such as Leon Kaiserling, said extending the wartime fiscal deficits would avert a return to the Depression. But the federal government, under President Harry Truman, ran fiscal surpluses over his eight years of, of, in office. What happened? In that span, the unemployment rate went down and the labor force participation rate went up from 19, whatever it was, to uh, 1952, from 1946 to 1952. Okay, that's evidence. Now, a little theory. Assume that the economy, while at equilibrium, or something, while at an equilibrium level of employment, equilibrium in every respect you can think of, is hit by a helicopter drop of public debt that, that falls into the hands of the public, and the government raises tax rates to service the added debt. It's just a story, it doesn't have to be realistic. Uh, households feeling more liquid may raise aggregate demand until prices rise and their liquid savings run low, as Keynesians might suggest. But there will also be a contraction of aggregate supply as marginal tax rates on wages and on profits reduce incentives to work and to invest, which will contract output and employment. Trump just doesn't realize the cost of that public debt that he is running up. And I'm afraid many of the economists uh, uh, also uh, don't get it. Another possibility is that the effect of a country's fiscal stimulus is diffused over the global economy so that a country feels little or nothing uh, who feels little or nothing of the stimulus. When I taught undergraduate macroeconomics uh, decades ago, um, I enjoyed drawing on the blackboard a rising LM curve, looks like that, and in the output interest rate plane, the output interest rate plane, and a rising L income, and then slicing through that a horizontal line whose height is given by the world real rate of interest, which we always called R star. The intersection of this horizontal line with that rising curve that in the diagram that determines output. Now, what about fiscal stimulus? Well, in that system, fiscal stimulus neither raises the real interest rate, uh, the world real interest rate, of course it doesn't do that, nor does it shift out the LM curve. It's an IS curve that's being shifted, not the LM curve but by uh, fiscal stimulus. So where does the stimulus go? As Bob Mandel used to amuse himself by asking people. And uh, he'd say, giggling, it goes abroad. <laughs> it goes overseas. Doesn't, only a negligible part of it stays at home. So that's the heart of Ma Robert Mandel's early work. Rudy Dornbusch later built another model of demand spilling out. Some theorists of employment determination put their emphasis on monetary policy, not fiscal policy. James Tobin, who taught me advanced macro, built a Keynesian model in which fiscal policy does not affect employment, and that's not all. But monetary policy, the supply of money or the cost of money in relation to the return on capital, does. 
But has monetary stimulus been effective? It's an empirical question. Maybe the entirety of the Keynesian edifice, not only the fiscal, not only the fiscal stimulus, but the monetary stimulus is flawed and, and underdependable, undependable to understate the situation. So I got to worrying, um, got to worrying again. What happened to my figure one? Oh, it's up. Oh. Now, can we go back to figure one? Because I missed it. Thanks. Thank goodness the audience didn't miss it. OK, uh, so you see there that fiscal stimulus, uh, uh, it's not true that the countries with the big fiscal stimulus got the faster recovery. Just the opposite. Now, let's go to figure two. <clears throat> so I got to wondering, <clears throat> did countries where monetary stimulus in the years after they hit bottom was relatively strong, measured by the quantity of money, monetary assets purchased by the central bank between 2011 and 2017, did that monetary stimulus prove to have a, prove to have a relatively, prove to promote a relatively speed, speedy recovery? Well, figure two does not, that does not support that belief either. So if both fiscal and monetary stimulus were pretty much ineffective, what was driving the relatively speedy recoveries? One possibility draws on Keynes's early insight. When Franklin Roosevelt took influ office in March 1933, amid radical ideas in response to the Deep Depression, Keynes warned Rose Roosevelt to be beware of policies that might cause a loss of business confidence. Perhaps Portugal, Italy, and Greece are having slow, if not stunted, recoveries, in large part because their fiscal profligacy has devastated business confidence. Iceland, it is said, recovered rapidly because it maintained the conf confidence of international investors. Gilfie Zweig is here to uh, tell us about Iceland. But I suspect there's another explanation for these statistical results. It may be that a nation with a relatively high level of dynamism, a nation overflowing with ideas for new products or methods and widespread zeal to develop and market them, would be quick to take advantage of empty shops, closed plants, and discharged workers who haven't found a job yet. So in that, from that perspective, we can expect that the relatively dynamic economies, the US, I would hope, still the US, and the UK come to mind, but also Sweden and, and to a degree, uh, Germany. Uh, so we can expect those countries to achieve a relatively rapid recovery regardless of the stimulus, or even in spite of the stimuli. So let's test this theory. Now, before I get to the figure, uh, of course, we're not sure there is much dynamism left in those high flyers of the West's glorious past. As my book, Mass Flourishing, maintains, innovation has declined in nations where it had been strong, though in the US it, 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 uh, it rose in a narrow set of new industries, leaving a net slowdown of American innovation. Figure three, so, with regard to testing the importance of dynamism, figure three shows a strong statistical relationship between, the, between this proxy for dynamism, and thus for innovation, and the speed of recovery. 
These results suggest that fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus are at best sideshows, that the main driver of recovery is dynamism, the same dynamism that drives everything good from wage growth to job satisfaction and life satisfaction. So in explaining re America's recovery and now its modest boom, I would give a lot of credit to American enterprise and what's left of its innovation and give no credit, little or no credit, to stimulus. So um, I can't go along with the economists who say that the data are showing that uh, Trump's, Trump's medicine is, is working. Now, on to my second theme, with little time left. What can economists or those from other disciplines infer will be the consequences of Trumpian policy for working age people in America? I view America as having had an economy in which large numbers of people uh, are continuously conceiving and developing new products or methods, and the governments are con constantly conceiving and developing new public goods and public services. For me, this was the good economy, though it never became the just economy, but it was at least the good economy. Jobs were rewarding. Large numbers of ordinary people reap the extraordinary experience of using their imagination and exercising their creativity in the course of their work. Even larger numbers of people could have a sense of autonomy. I keep forgetting Richard Sennett's word, beginning with A. Agency, that's it. I'm constantly blocking on that word. Large numbers of people could have a sense of agency, of succeeding at something, or perhaps making a difference in the world. And families could have the sense of achievement or advancement from generation to generation. That kind of life, this wonderland which spread over the West after the Napoleonic War over the 19th century, seems to have gone into some degree of decline some decades ago. Whole communities and regions now have a sense of detachment from the rewards of challenge and achievement. Many of us scholars are desperate to grasp how this decline came about. Perhaps the decline was caused by a growth of materialism, avarice, dishonesty, and more. This decline is simply not addressed by Trump Trumpian theory. It cannot be addressed because having no idea of what the good economy is, it does not see how much of the good economy has been lost and does not see the weakening of the values that nourish the good economy. Trump himself shows a total ignorance of that, uh, of that, uh, of such a life and such values. Thank you.